Uh, can I first start by thanking Uncle Tony Garvey for um, the incredible welcome to country and it really probably um, has set my, my keynote up in a really good way because a lot of the things that he talked about um, I'll share with you today. Can I also acknowledge Kathleen in the room. Um, thank you for being here, thank you for supporting our communities um, and of course Dr Sandra De Mayo. It's always a pleasure to see um, Sandro out in the wild sometimes, um, other than sitting behind the desk of the project. Um, can I also acknowledge that no matter where we are in Australia, we walk on Aboriginal land and I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and to those who are emerging. Um, as always with a lot of the speeches and keynotes that I give, I like to set the tone in it being in and around trust. Um, and particularly the stories that I share have been entrusted to me by the communities in which I've served or which I've um, collaborated with. And their advice always was that in order to um, listen, um, carry and hold their stories, I myself have to be open, authentic um, and transparent. And so that mantra of being, particularly for First Nations people, reflects our demand for authenticity in multiple ways. And it's really captured in a very simple um, kind of mantra, if you will, which is to hear and know their stories, I must also tell my own. So I'm a queer Radjuri man. I come from central New South Wales. Uh, known as the people of three rivers, Radjuri populations have inhabited modern day central New South Wales for about 60,000 years. At the time of British settlement, an estimated 3,000 Radjuri were living in the region, which represented one of Australia's largest indigenous cultural footprints. Radjuri country is one of beauty. Now, I do acknowledge that most Aboriginal people state the claim that their country is the most beautiful. However, Radjuri country can only be truly described as dramatic, uh, majestic. The Radjuri nation is the second largest clan group um, in Australia, which extends from the Great Dividing Range to the east and is bordered by the Macquarie, uh, Lachlan and the Murrumbidgee rivers. Today, Radjuri populations can be found throughout larger New South Wales um, regional areas such as Bathurst, Dubbo, Orange, Lithgow and Wagga Wagga. Condobolin, which is my hometown, is the Kalari people's homeland and is considered the heartbeat of Radjuri nation. It is anecdotally considered um, uh, by other Radjuri communities um, to be that heartbeat. Condobolin, though, is a low socioeconomic community suffering severe climate change amid decades long social and political isolation. Um, my mother, Georgina um, Chatfield, was adopted out by her mother, uh, my grandmother, out of fear of being taken by the state. My grandmother, June Chatfield, was removed from her country, and her grandmother, my great grandmother, survived the frontier wars. My dad, Kevin Fernando, spent most of his life in prison. He spent his childhood, uh, he was taken as a child and spent most of his life, um, in most of his early childhood in Kinchilla Aboriginal Boys Home, which we now know has devastated an entire generation of Aboriginal men. Um, his father, my grandfather, started his life on the cotton farms of northern New South Wales and continues to be involved in the cotton industry to this day. His father, my great-grandfather, um, was an indentured slave to that cotton industry um, and was killed during the frontier wars. Despite this generational impact and of colonialism and imperialism, my parents, their parents and their parents uh, being raised in survival mode um, translated the gift of love to me and my sisters. This narrative is, is familiar to many Aboriginal people and has occurred for the past five or so generations. Despite this, and as many of us now know, Aboriginal people are taking up opportunities that were just weren't available to previous generations. This has been my experience, that despite the impact and its system, I've been afforded an opportunity and like many young Aboriginal people, have grasped these opportunities with both hands. But in doing so, it has resulted in an interesting experience that I want to share with you today. As a result, me and many other young Aboriginal people often leave our communities to head into the city uh, and we find ourselves living in urban centres, leading more cosmopolitan lifestyles. But that shift is a result of an amplified strategy that was conceived by older Aboriginal Australians, much more influential Aboriginal people. Here, you water. Thanks. Um, Aboriginal people born between, I'm going to show my age here, Aboriginal people born between 1987 and 1992 
entered a world in which prominent Aboriginal leaders were pushing for significant rights in Indigenous land, health and education. Thank you. And they demanded a significant shift in and improved outcomes. And many of these leaders were the first to occupy a seat at contemporary Australia's table. And as a result, their vision led to the success of a new generation of Aboriginal people, a new generation of Indigenous ways of doing and Indigenous ways of being. And so that was the generation that I was born into. These Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander visionaries um, guided Australian policy and political discourse to conceive a world that promoted and normalised a very simple idea that an Aboriginal person could finish high school, go to university and get a job. As a generation, we were supported to participate and actively engage in shaping Australia's future. At the same time, this vision held that these First Nations people would begin to break the cycle of disadvantage and in doing so become a collective pillar of Indigenous excellence. This was the monument monumental task set to change a series of deficit thinking held deeply by previous generations of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in Australia. And while this change is obviously still ongoing, the shift in narrative um, to influence the lived generation of an entire generation who become the first to finish high school, go to university and get a job is now beginning to happen. Comparatively, um, we've seen the first 20 years of the new millennia see more fairer and equitable rights for Australia's LGBTQA plus communities. And that has allowed them to openly flourish too. The complexity of race, of culture, of gender provides an intersectional nuance that is slowly being grounded, I think, in our ways of doing and in our ways of being, particularly within health institutions. For many decades, if not centuries, these two Australian communities, First Nations and queer, have shared the troubled path towards victory and have fought battles alongside each other. But for those who have a foot in each camp, we're yet to feel the glory and the acceptance of both within those settings. When queer people come out for the first time, it can often be a remarkable experience. Um, you find out who you are, your hidden traits become a reality, um, and you share that personal journey with people in your family or in your communities. Of course, some people come out to violent, turbulent responses. Nonetheless, the journey of coming out allows oneself to display those hidden traits. The process of coming out can often force a queer person or a trans person to consider their desires, their hopes and their dreams and aspirations um, and to be viewed within how you are now visibly in the world. At the age of 21, I took a trip back to Condoblin, my hometown. I was living in Sydney at the time, studying at the University of Sydney and working for the New South Wales government. Um, and that trip back to country was one that I've done more times than I can ever recall. But this particular drive back home was the first time that I'd realised that I was coming back onto country as an out queer man. And on that trip, I reflected about the complexities of my racial identity, my outer visible identity as an Aboriginal person, but my inner identity as a Wiradjuri person. You know, Aboriginal people are often asked the question, what does it mean to be Aboriginal? Queer people are now being asked, what does it mean to be queer? You know, we're, we're starting to see this, this trend emerge. And for some Aboriginal people, there, there are clear rules and, and protocols that exist to respond to Aboriginality. Um, there are, there are boundaries and limitations to that responses. There are also historical, um, personal and public and self-determining <coughs> responses. But on that trip back to country, I asked myself a question that I'd never previously considered. What does it mean to be a queer or adjury person? And I've yet to discover an answer to that question, um, partly I think because of the locations in which I'm living and the ways in which I'm serving communities, I can never fully bring myself into that landscape. And so when I thought about doing a PhD, that was the very topic that I wanted to discover. Was I individually, ex uniquely experiencing that? Or were other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer people also experiencing the same? Throughout my doctoral research, I witnessed the extent to which homophobia, transphobia and biphobia have framed queer Indigenous people's experiences and perceptions of the health system 
the very services that should be supporting us instead contribute to isolation and the perception that queer Indigenous people should remain marginalised and excluded. We see the same things happening around women, people with disabilities, those from refugees and migrant communities, particularly when we use a cultural first model. It's in these settings where we found that intersectionality was missing. I could attend an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander health service and receive culturally appropriate services, but I had to leave my queerness at the door. I could attend an LGBTQ plus health service and have that part of me be affirmed, but I had to leave my Aboriginality at the door. Both places offered, both spaces offered refuge, but at the same time I experienced racism in one and homophobia in the other. And so I have to assume that that happens for most of us in our communities when we live intersectional lives. That if we're walking into a space in which affirms us in one setting, it must be unaffirming in another. So I think I'm running out of 10 minutes. Oh, sweet. I was like cutting through a lot of that. Great. Um, but the belief that um, heterosexuality is the preferred or normal sexual orientation is much a direct threat to the survival and advancement of queer and indigenous people just as racism is. Many services understand poor health outcomes driven by racism, systemic or otherwise, but often look the, overlook the drivers of poor health outcomes driven by homophobia, biphobia or transphobia. When, um, when indigenous people see queer indigenous people, they often see our queerness as white. You have to remember that colonisation was not just about land, it was also about bodies. And when we lost our queerness and our identities to that queerness that extended beyond 1788, like most homogenous cultures, we find and locate ourselves within the majority. So my queerness, when portrayed, is often viewed as white. So this notion that Aboriginal people looked at me had fears that I've assimilated too much because the location of that queerness is predominantly within a white setting, if that makes sense. And so um, the opposite is true, really, because what we have found is that the arrival of the First Fleet brought with it the buggery laws, which on day one of colonial invasion said that um, that new law would spark how it is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly queer people, could display their gender identities or their queerness. And that story of that law told us how our full human complexity was to be denied. Um, other examples of the way in which racism and other phobias occur within settings um, can be found particularly in high school settings. So an example is when I graduated high school in 2006, apologies for anybody in the room who was alive and an adult at that time. Um, I graduated high school uh, in 2006 and became the first Aboriginal person in my high school setting to graduate high school. Now, to give context, 20% of my high school was Aboriginal, yet somehow I was the first in 2006. Um, at the time, I was unaware of the significance of the first. Um, throughout my upbringing and my secondary education, I was influenced by a narrative of Indigenous disadvantage. I believed in Indigenous deficit discourse, um, that, and that deficit was the only margin in which I could perform my Aboriginality. This soft bigotry of low expectation also fueled the concept that any form of Indigenous excellence or success was to assimilate. It meant that personal, uh, individual success was at the detriment of community. This trope is intimately tied to historical tropes about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which merely refer to the, the destruction of our cultures. Tropes like the last of his tribe forged a narrative deep within Australia's psyche. It signalled that Australia's colonial expansion occurred at the expense of Indigenous disenfranchisement, and in many ways it does. My high schooling was filled with low expectations and any encouragement to understand what success looked like was never fully, fully represented to me. But in recognising the mass um, significance of graduation rates, those rates of, of graduation have gone up. Um, after high school, I attended four national Indigenous leadership retreats and conventions where I met hundreds of Indigenous Australians who were the first doctors, lawyers, academics, CEOs. Many of these were in their 30s and 40s, and they were amongst the first to enter Australian universities, 
and to governments and work with corporate institutions to pave a road for future Aboriginal people. And they were from all walks of life. They were remote, rural, old, young, community smart, book smart, fair and dark skin. You know, before that, I seldom met an Aboriginal person who had succeeded, let alone seeing queer Aboriginal people thrive. To see queer Indigenous people breaking the cycle of disadvantage was an incredible and life-altering experience. Um, it was the first time that my, my life was reflected back to me in that way. In 2024, though, we have an ever-increasing Indigenous graduation rate. Over the next 10, 10 years, we will see 100,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate high school. 100,000, which is great, but where are we going to put them? Governments right across Australia are building prisons at rates that are alarming. We have an increase of housing, environmental, sustainability, health, education. It's a really, really worrying trend to see how we're building pipelines for these young people that might have to leave their communities once again to come into the cities. It's a big policy challenge um, and something that I don't want to alarm everybody in the room to start shifting their entire work plans to figure it out, but um, it's just something that I want you to reflect on. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, when I was finishing my PhD, I got a phone call from uh, Roe Allen quite early in the morning. Uh, Roe is the Victorian Human Rights Commissioner, um, but at the time was the Gender and Sexuality Commissioner. Um, I first met Roe uh, maybe a week into when they started in that position, and I jokingly said to them, when you're done, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> Seven years later, they called me. <laughs> Are you ready? And I'm like, no. And so I had the pleasure of becoming um, the LGBTQ plus commissioner for Victoria. Um, I, I, at the time of my appointment, was the youngest commissioner in Australian history and the first Aboriginal person to lead a non-Aboriginal commission, which is no small feat for a first, first, first time person graduating high school. Um, central to the broader efforts of being commissioner, and as I reflect on that, was in embedding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within equality um, policy. And it wasn't without its challenges. Um, where we had an incredible premier under Dan Andrews, who would, on a daily basis, remind us that in Victoria, equality was not negotiable. I often found myself negotiating. Negotiating with health institutions around how we deal and tackle with inter intersectionality. Negotiating with local councils around what it means to engage with people on the ground and in those in communities. Engaging with hospitals and education systems around being able to have the door be affirming. You know, one of the community members during my time as commissioner told me they've built many doors, but I just want to find one that feels like home. And it grabbed me right here in the heart because we have. We have said there is no wrong door. We have said you can knock on any door and that door will open. And that's the system we've built. But I want to, I want to take a moment to reflect on where we go from that once the person walks through the door. We can have many rainbow flag lanyards, many Aboriginal flag lanyards, yet if the person at the front desk doing the intake is awkward around asking the question, are you Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? Do you identify as LGBTQ+, is your sex at birth different from your current gender? then that person immediately, after entering the door, is going to feel like they've got to put their bag, pick their bag back up and hold it with them, or leave one part of their identity at the door. That's not a system I think we've ever imagined. It's not a system in which is appropriate for our communities. And while I speak particularly on Indigenous and queer, it has to happen for many of our migrant and refugee communities. Many of our communities who um, proudly identify with their faith by wearing hijabs in public. Many communities who put their whole self on the line while walking outside of their front door and into the doors that we've created. So 
On that note, I want to challenge us to look ahead around the systems that we've learnt and built and think, who is it that we're missing? Who's not in the room? Who's afraid to walk into the door? And admits, admit these endeavours, um, I think we'll frequently find ourselves in witnessing the reluctance of various sectors to progress at the same rate that others are progressing at. You know, moving from equality to equity to allowing the door to be opened so that nobody is left behind, I think is truly an aspiration in which where we're going. Um, I do want to touch on, in the last two minutes, um, a reflection on last year's vote, um, which Uncle Tony um, amazingly set up for me. Uh, as we push for inclusivity and representation in Australia, um, the urgency to close the health gap for many communities, be it Aboriginal, queer or otherwise, um, is reaching critical, critical demand. But last year's success, sorry, the f last year's for failure um, of Australia to vote in favour of, um, of the voice is something that I can only imagine um, and will come to no surprise of you is that the system has been so rigged against us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, that journey and that rejection um, has cast a long shadow collectively over our efforts for genuine reconciliation and um, representation. This moment was more than a political decision. It was a reflection of broader societal attitudes towards Aboriginal people and our place within the fabric of Australian democracy. The deflation and disappointment felt in the wake of this decision cannot be understated. It represents a missed opportunity to recognise our rights to have a say in matters that affect our lives and our communities directly. But this setback, however, does not mark the end of our journey. It underscores the need to continue to advocate for structural change and for avenues to amplify Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices. It also is a way in which for other communities who feel isolated or on the margins to understand what community organising should feel and look like, from local councils to the highest levels of government. In the wake of the referendum where a staggering 60% voted no, we must confront the reality that our collective journey towards reconciliation is about all of us. Saying no to one group of Australians is like saying no to everybody else. You know, that no was not just for Aboriginal people, it was for every other Australian who might be a little different, who might not feel the acceptance and the glory of being in Australia, who might still get the question, where are you really from? That no represents a lot of that. And it's up to all of us, I think, to mirror the reflecting world that we want to live in. And that starts with um, uncomfortable but necessary questions about our collective willingness to confront and dismantle the layers of prejudice and misunderstanding in our societies, to confront the policies that we're setting within our health institutes, within our units, within our teams, it starts with ethical listening. To truly be provocative, uh, we must ask ourselves, I think, are we ready to listen, not with just ears, but with our hearts? Are we prepared to move beyond the comfort of our preconceived notions and engage with stories that challenge us, that make us uncomfortable, that force us to confront the biases and the prejudices we hold? The journey towards reconciliation and to genuine um, understanding demands nothing less. As we navigate this path, I want us to be guided by a commitment to ethical listening that does more than acknowledge the extent of the diverse narratives we hear. Let's engage with these stories in a way that acknowledges the pain, the resiliences and the hope that they embody. Let this be our collective challenge, to listen with intent, to allow our discomfort to be the catalyst for genuine empathy and action, and to ensure that the voices of queer, of trans, of Aboriginal, of migrant, of refugee, are consciously heard and truly understood and valued. But in the end, the discomfort we feel in confronting these truths is a small price to pay for the opportunity to forge a more inclusive, empathetic and just Australia.
The question remains, are you brave enough to listen? Thank you.